Hi everyone, welcome to another one of my uh, Facebook Lives. Today I wanted to talk about, um, and I'm using the term normalization, but how our clients, our pet owners, tend to see those early aggression behaviors or what you know leads to the actual bite, okay? Meaning that the bite is the big, bad, aggressive behavior. How seeing the early aggressive behaviors as normal is not a problem uh, can you know create difficulty with setting up realistic expectations for how we can reduce the actual biting and more severe aggression. Also, why clients may see these behaviors as normal, you know, why they do not see these behaviors as a problem. And then thirdly, just some ideas of how we can address this, you know, address this issue, this normalization, or if you want to call it conditioning, whatever words you choose to use, of the early aggressive behaviors or other contributing behaviors to the bite and more severe aggression, how we can help our break through that and help our clients uh, maybe see things differently so that we can have better, um, you know, better uh, cooperation and follow through with our behavior modification plans. So I've, pardon my messy handwriting, <laughs> I'm not that good at that. And if you see Binks, I just decided to let him run around here in the big Bella Behavior Learning Center just for fun anyway. Um, he's on the table right next to me. Anyhow, I've broken this down into, this is gonna be our dog column, our canine column. This is our feline column. So I'm gonna talk about both dogs and cats on this issue. And then in the middle here is play behaviors. Okay, play behaviors that often are a part of the contribution to usually housemate aggression. Okay, so let's start with the dog. So I have down here, now this is coming from Dr. Kendall's, let me reach and get some of my handouts here. Uh, this handout here, this is Dr. Kendall Shepard's Canine Ladder of Aggression. I do have this. I have this on my website, drsallyjfoot.com. Under the Veterinary Resources tab, you can download it for free with the text that came, Dr. Kendall Shepard publishes in 2002. And so on this Ladder of Aggression, we're going to focus on these top dark orange going up to the red behaviors. Because that's really where, that's where we're at. This is what is being normalized some of this is being normalized. And we're already up in the red zone and that's really, really creating part of the problem. So I'm looking at stiffening up and staring, the growl, sorry, staring, growling or barking. And I mean over, like that over excessive deep barking, okay? Um, snap, that's the attempted bite, like the dog who's just, you know, snapping in the air at the other dog or snapping in the air at the child reaching for them or snapping in the air to the veterinary or the shelter staff. We see this too in our work, you know, that our own staff is getting conditioned to these behaviors thinking they're not a problem because they're not actually getting bitten yet. Okay. Anyway, how then we go up to snap and then ultimately the bite. And of course there are different intensity levels to the bite, but let's just say bite as a general term. So remember each step, and the normal dog, I'm not talking about reactive dogs, I'm talking about the average normal dog, is 0.2 seconds per step. So a dog can go from stare to growling to attempting to bite, and bite if they follow all of the steps, that's four steps, in one second or less than one second to what the dog sees as a threat. Now, what typically happens is in a home, and I'm, I'm speaking as coming from and general, uh, general veterinary practice background, in addition to, you know, being more focused in uh, concentrated on behavior, um, behavior consultation, and and so on, is that until until the victim dog is actually injured, they actually receive a puncture wound that is deep enough to require veterinary attention, meaning to get stitched up or an abscess formed, an infection formed, that now the dog needs to come in to have this wound flushed and treated, etc. All of this staring at each other, growling at each other, attempting to bite at each other has gone on in the home. And oftentimes, I'm here, I'm here when I get in with the consult, it's because the bite has already occurred and actually the bite has been bad enough 
to require veterinary attention. So, you know, how, did, how does it get here? You know, how does it get this bad? Why are clients not seeing all of this as being a problem? And I think it comes from a couple different places. And I'm gonna get into that more at the end of this as we address this. But part of this escalation can be due to this, the play behaviors that the dogs have and they've been encouraged to have. So what is very common in housemate aggression is that we also have dogs who are doing what I call the body slamming rough and rowdy play, which is that impulsive reactive play. But what it is, is that it starts usually at about eh, five, six months of age, maybe even younger, four months of age, that the dogs will literally be jumping up on each other, mouthing around the neck, mouthing around the legs, and they're chasing each other. And yes, initially, it may be a little bit of that give and take, and older um, information has been to let the dogs work it out, yet what happens over time is that the dogs are learning to run and to jump on each other and to grab and to bite around the neck. Now, as their teeth change, as they start to develop and you know the adult canine teeth erupt and are in position by six to seven months of age, now the grabbing around the neck is more painful and it's a stronger bite. So in the midst of running around and having a good time, the one, one of the dogs jumping on the other, now when he takes you know, that grab and it hurts, the victim dog may growl and there may have been some growling between both of them and the running, but now if you really listen to it, the growl changes and it deepens, but the client doesn't hear this. The client just sees, oh, they're having fun and they're having playing. Well, the victim dog now is getting actually bitten around the neck and does a quick head flip and he's actually trying to bite, but now it's shifting from just that my body's charged up and I want to grab things with my mouth to actually more of that I see you as a threat and I want to bite at you. I want you to stop it. Okay, so the shift is from just that running rough housing to actually, oh, no, 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 you're getting too strong, you're getting too heavy on me, I want you to quit. And the steps in this play behavior, this impulsive reactive play behavior, I have not read any actual measurements of this. Maybe they are out there, I'd love it if any of you wanna comment and tell me that they are. This again, we wanna be sharing, we wanna be collaborative on this information. Yet, you know, if you watch the dogs, and you, and you look at even timing, say on these videos, YouTube videos, uh, we're probably within that 0.1 to 0.2 seconds per step. And I'm gonna say it's probably gonna be even at the faster rate, 0.1 or 0.05 seconds per step, because the body, is, the body is activated. That the neurology of the brain to the muscles of the body is firing really fast, which means then shifts in emotional state and perception and sensory input will also shift more quickly. And so that's how what looks like normal play shifting over to aggression happens in a split second. And then before you know it, you have the one dog pinning the other dog down. It's actually pinning, it is not play. So to the client though, to your owner, they're looking at the dogs in the backyard, running around going, oh yeah, they always play like this, they're having a great time. And you're on the console and you're saying that it's not fun. <laughs> they're actually aggressing at each other. See the growl, see how he grabs, see how the one is steering, ears are back. And the client just looks confused. He, what do you mean? This is how they've always played. This is how we were told to encourage them to play. This is, they look like they were having fun. Nobody's gotten hurt. This isn't when they're hurting each other. It's around the food dish that they actually had their ear ripped open and we had to take them in the emergency clinic for a $700 repair bill, okay? Now we all understand, or I hope that we all do, that the impact of this rough and rowdy play is how these two dogs are practicing quickly lunging up on each other, quickly grabbing with the mouth, and quickly engaging the teeth, going into bite. Even if it's in a non-threatening state, even if it is in play, sorry, is in play, it's practice. It's physical practice that they remember it, memory. And then secondly, it truly is creating these neural pathways that make it like an automatic pilot, just really easy for the body to go there. That is the why, the reason why we have to reduce this impulsive play to help reduce going up to aggression. Now we know this, so how are we gonna explain this to the client? Something that they saw as fun, the dogs seem to enjoy. It's an outlet for that aerobic play and activity that many of these dogs need. Maybe they're of a breed type, like a terrier breed, uh, which is very common in the terrier breeds. Um, that it's like, how do you, how do you 
control this or how do you reduce this? Okay, there could be a whole nother lecture on how we're gonna manage the impulsive play, but pretty much in the short way, my short explanation is, you know, it's just like if I constantly was learn how to quickly throw a punch, when I need to throw a punch, I'm gonna do it right away really fast. I may not even think about doing it. Okay, this is the why we need to control it. Now the how will be when we go out in the backyard, we have four tennis balls. And as soon as I throw one to dog A, I'm gonna throw the second one to dog B in an opposite direction. We start having these dogs playing opposite each other, running opposite each other, and we use drag lines. So when one wants to lunge up on the other, you're gonna pull them away, praise them, tie them up, settle down for a few minutes, and really be settled before we release again. And that may be as far as you go with that part of the plan. Uh, but this is the why and the how this affects this. But this is also why it can be hard for our clients to see this as a problem. It looks fun. They've been told by many sources, it is fun, it is good for them to do. This is how dogs learn, you know, to buy inhibition, etc. And while some of that may be true, oftentimes it's gone too far and nobody knew about it and led us to over here. Um, the second thing is really, of course, learning to read that body language and the body language of this particular dog. And a lot of people won't, don't realize, they don't realize when a dog is staring, that is what the dog is doing and then what that really means. And again, as I said before, the stare, growling or excessive barking, you know, one dog standing in front of the other one, bark, 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 like to stay away from me, or snapping but missing, there is no harm to the human. There is nothing that is affecting them. The dogs did not get injured, it's just kind of a pain in the rear. Maybe they have tried things like calling them away and getting treats and they'll sit good for the treat, but they still go back in this problem because they don't, we haven't done, you know, we haven't done the consult to know the triggers for this aggression, et cetera, and how to really manage the environment better. But it's, it's this, everybody is pre, most people, and I was trained this way as well as veterinarian, okay? Aggression is biting. Nobody taught me about this part. So that's one big part of our trouble. Um, the other one is, if it doesn't bother me, why should, you know, and I'm not seeing the animals really affected by it, like they only do this around the food dish, all the rest of the day they're fine, then why would I invest the time and energy, you know, into trying to change that, okay? Now a third uh, kind of rationale, I have not too often, but I did come up with, or came across, came to me, sorry. One time was a client said, well, I don't care if they're doing all this fighting, I just don't want them to bite. They just, it's like they almost, I just don't want them to go that last step. Why? Because, well, I think one of the dogs had been into the referring veterinarian for multiple bite wounds and a ripped ear. So now this client could say, well, when they actually get to a bite, it can get really bad. So let's just, can we just back it off down to here? And you know, it was a little bit of, uh, I guess you could say work for myself to help that client understand that, you know, that's a heck of a lot of mental control to try to allow, like for the dog to allow themselves to get this physically animated, you know, like the body is just running on all cylinders and the, uh, seeing the threat to be so bad that the dog wants to use his teeth but is just holding back on it you know, I kind of just, I'll just throw a punch, but not really hit you. That takes a heck of a lot of mental control, which is not, the brain is not capable of doing that when they're at this level. So it took a while to find, the client finally realized that, but I think having a very clear message that as this physical escalation goes up, you know, meaning how fast they're literally running, how fast they're lunging, and these body language signs are becoming more intense to say, I'm gonna use my teeth, that there is less of the thinking brain engaged. And we need to make it that simply stated. So uh, this is, these kinds of statements can help with the breakthrough of understanding why we've got to at least catch them at stare and intervene here. In my experience, I'd love to hear from you guys in your experience. I can get most of these clients who you know, don't really see the uh, two dogs staring at each other over the food bowl as a problem to the point of, 
let's be sure we're intervening at growl, okay? The, they, they may actually intervene at stare, they may follow the plan, but by and large, they really won't because it's hard for them to bite into staring and growling being a problem because it's been tolerated, frankly, for years. A lot of these dogs have been doing staring since they were four month old puppy around the other dog. And now when the consult is done at four years of age, there's been three and three quarters years of staring. And so the human, the people in the home are just conditioned to it themselves. They see this as normal. Of course the dogs are gonna stare at a food dish. What's the big deal? And so, you know, I guess I figure, you know what? I am going to do, I'm gonna to try to work with what I can work with. And over time, just if we can reduce the actual bite and injury, that's a lot of benefit on welfare. So I think some of it is for ourselves to be realistic on what might now be that true goal behavior, okay, and, and achievable. Secondly, to be clear with our clients as well, I'll tell you what, if he's into stare, he's still at stare. We have a much, much higher likelihood you're gonna get bites. You're gonna get more relapsing and fall through than if we work lower. Hey, the choice is yours, okay? I can't make you do what you don't want to do, but at this, you know, it's not hurting the client. It's been going on for so long. They just see it as normal. This is a part of why we may not get complete histories of our body language. You know, you may ask a client, well, is he doing any staring? No, no. Is he doing any growling? No, no. And especially now if you're on video chat, as you're asking that and you hear growling behind you and you have a client turn the camera around and here you see the two dogs staring at each other and growling happening while there's a rawhide right there on the floor. You say, no, they're doing this right now. No, they're not. Yes, they are. Let's listen to it. Oh, really? Okay, that, that client is being sincere, and I, I try to have some empathy for this. I'm not going to get an argument with them. But I mean, to at least, and that's a good thing too about if you're video recording your video chats. Um, I've been using GoToMeeting, which is really, what I like about it is when it records, I, get, well, I have a link that they can review the recording easily. We don't have to get into big uploads and downloads and it's HIPAA compliant. But to have that as the evidence that can be reviewed, that also can be really helpful for seeing it and possibly believing it. Okay, so now let's talk about our cats over here. Our kitty cats actually go through similar, you know, similar uh, process. Uh, as veterinarians especially, we rarely, frankly, we rarely hear about the cats fighting with each other in the home. And the reason why is that cats, frankly, very rarely actually get up to biting on each other. There's a heck of a lot of staring, there's the yowling, there's the swatting, there's the pouncing, but to really have a bite from the aggressing cat onto the victim cat, that creates a puncture, that then creates an infection, that brings them into the veterinarian does not happen that often between two housemate cats. What we tend to get is more of the inappropriate urination because of the stress in the household or body blocking, you know, over the litter boxes. You know, one cat really can't get in, they're gonna get in a fight. But this is what's happening. And I almost think, frankly, uh, in our feline households, that this, when cats are staring at each other, the running and chasing and pouncing on each other, the swatting at each other, one's on a perch, the other one walks up and looks and does a swat, and the other one swats, and the other one swats, and then you get the hiss and the growl, and then the one jumps off the perch, and the other one chases and runs through the house. That is, it is completely missed, as seeing that as any form of aggression. It might be seen as like, yeah, he's kind of crabby, yeah, yeah, it's just kind of a pain in the butt, sorry. Um, or they're playing. I hear that so much more frequently in the feline household as compared to the canine household, but that is all this aggression. Now sometimes, yes, young cats. So let's go back to cat behavior and cat play behavior. When kittens are about 12 weeks of age, uh, that is really when their predatory skills are really increasing, they're really refining, their vision has become much more acute, much more um, sharp. They can focus on things much more readily. They can like see and perceive and follow motion of small things like grasshoppers and cockroaches and frogs, you know, and little mice or whatever, or even their toys playing around. And thirdly, the response from the kitten then is the predatory play, meaning they hunker down, they see it, 
and then they jump on it and they grab it with their mouth and then they also want to grab it with the four paws and tread with the back feet that's the full predatory sequence in the cat and they're doing this in play because the play is a part of their practice for actual predation for killing now then at 12 weeks of age two kittens playing on each other that little bit of rough and tumble teeth are small that's okay even 12 week old kitten maybe doing this on an adult cat the adult cat may scamper away or may kind of do a rustle back a bit but again when that kitten is now five months of age approximately those adult teeth will be down in place the kitten is physically larger, their body size is becoming closer to that of the adult cat, and they become even more skillful <laughs> at seeing and pouncing and grabbing because it's, it's the hunting skills they've been practicing. So now the kitten in play going after the adult cat or even two five, six month old kittens playing this way, you'll start to see a shift. You'll start to see that growling more and maybe even biting at each other, yet they don't create puncture wounds. Now, what will happen though is that first little growl, you know, pounce, lunge, bite. Sorry, I did this one in the backward order. Um, anyway, in the cats, you will still hear that change in the intensity of the growl, and you'll see like ears flattening. That's the shift. Cats do the same thing. They start with the pounce, lunge, scamper, grabbing, biting, and then you'll, if the victim cat is really getting bitten by the one pouncing on them, you're going to see the ears flatten on the victim cat and then maybe also on the aggressing cat because now they're actually shifting over into this. They're seeing each other as a threat and the bites being a threat. But again, this happens very quickly. You know, cats on this, my feline ladder of aggression here, you can also get off my website, whoops, on my website uh, under the veterinary resources tab. Cats go up that ladder twice as fast as dogs. Normally, they're 0.1 second. So of course in their play, they're going to be very quick in the shift. So again, that's either missed, client can't really see it, it's happening so fast. Secondly, the client doesn't know or realize those ears flatten back and the um, kind of more intense yowl means this cat is over into aggression, not into play. Thirdly, it may happen all, all the time and nobody gets hurt. Well, so what was the big deal, right? So it's client acceptance on this. Um, and lastly, because they don't often cause serious injury on each other, it's not a problem for the human, unless it goes into the litter box problems, and it is a big problem for the human. Okay, so with my feline clients, honest to gosh, in my experience, this rough and tumble kind of play, you know, issue, uh, the easiest way for me to kind of break through with the, that client on why we need to have the cat who's doing the chasing, the wanting to pounce and play, which it may truly be predatory play. Okay, we may have the younger cat, older cat scenario. That, in my experience, has been the most common intercat aggression, you know, pairing. So we have the younger cat who hasn't had many ways or places to vent this normal predatory play. They aren't outside hunting, they don't have the toys to attack, etc. Immediately putting, just saying, listen, younger kitty needs to put this predatory play on a different object than your adult cat, simply stated. Because that pouncing on your older cat is, if it hasn't already, it's gonna lead to inappropriate urination. Somebody's gonna be peeing out of the box and causing thousands of dollars of damage to your home. You know, and they probably already have had that, yeah, you're right. Or uh, we may have, or maybe they do see because it might be like a 10 year old cat, right? And an older cat, and it's the one they're more bonded to. And they now they're like, oh my gosh, this is really hard on our older cat. And you say, yes, it is. Thank you, yes, it is. <laughs> so you're gonna talk from the point of welfare on that older cat. That older cat, it's like you being, you know, a 70 year old grandma and the 10 year old child runs up and keeps jumping on your back. Okay, that is, can hurt your cat's body and you know, all this, so let's, Get the kitten's behavior onto the stuffed toy. Let's toss the food, no more eating out of the bowl. Let's use lots of food puzzles and have a pro, you know, the, the purchase. So the biggest thing that I found to break through for the cat issue is um, it's normal, normal predatory play, but we have to have the right object the cat's gonna put it on. And putting it on the brother or sister cat is not the right object because they can't kill their brother or sister. Frankly, as I say, a cat be cat's a cat who thinks they killed something every day. 
So the cat has to be able to sink their teeth into it. They have to be able to grab it and tread it. So what's that gonna be? This stuffed toy on a string that you drag. So like killing the bear, I call it kill the bear, like killing a teddy bear. Or the food that you're tossing the nuggets to bounce on the floor, like the little cockroach or cricket. So the cat pounces on that and they eat the food. By eating the food, then they're not only rewarded for the play, but they're kind of satisfying the full part, you know, of that predatory sequence by taking something in orally. So that is the number one thing to at least get the client to do the steps that's going to reduce, you know, this aggression that's been accepted in the home. Um, you know, and that's, I think we, I think also too, going back to if, if we have, if we are, if we're not putting up the purchase, now this is the thing in our cat households, I still get a bit of resistance to, you know, installing shelves in the walls or, you know, rearranging the furniture and things like this because it affects the humans, you know, they've got the home set up how they want it. So they resist that. And so therefore there may still be more cornering of the cats, you know, because they're competing over space or there's too many cats walking along on the living room floor. Uh, so for that, I will say one of two things. We have the suction cup perches that can go on windows. Do we have windows we can put those up on because they don't damage any walls. They're relatively inexpensive, about 20 bucks a piece on Chewy.com. You can try them in different areas and take them off and try them elsewhere as you're figuring out the best place for it. So it's not as if you did all this work and change and then the cats don't like it. Um, so that's one way I can get clients to comply with adding these perches so the cats can get up and get away from each other. This to reduce the cornering. The second thing would be if they won't do that and they're still getting the cornering, I just say, okay, look, you're gonna have two cats that stay fighting and you will, you're eventually gonna have eliminate, you know, urination outside of the box or other heart disease and other welfare problems. And the choice is yours, the choice is yours. I can't make you do anything you don't want to do, but I want you to understand why you're, while it, it's just staring and nothing really bad is happening, you're going to get a, you're going to get a different, you're going to get a problem down the road and it's going to be harder to reduce because these cats are in the habit of it. So I guess that's the last point is, you know, we can't make clients do everything. And when people get, I say a belief, um, which is a practice thought. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Stephanie Russell Beast, and I'm watching her Facebook Lives on, um, you know, uh, behavioral psychology and thought and feeling processes. And a thought is is a thought, and beliefs are thought thoughts you've had, you've practiced so much that you turn them into a belief. So anyway, a belief is uh, something that they they've thought for a long time or they've learned for a long time, and it's really hard sometimes to penetrate through some people's beliefs. Um, so I, myself, and I'd like to hear from some of you guys, you know, try to just stay with what, what action can this client take or would they be willing to take that will decrease, say, this uh, reactive play that tends to be a big factor in going into the aggression because this is really a big part of what leads us to the other two. So for our cats, it's the young cat gets to kill something every day and it's not gonna be his brother. And for our dogs, it's going to be, we learn how to play on running away from each other for toys that we are thrown or tossed. And if we try to jump on each other, we're very positively rewarded for coming away with the tool of a drag line. Um, some handouts, you know, analogies to like the human situation can also help. That's one last thing. So on the Dr. Sophia Yin website, oops, hang on. there are a couple of handouts that can, I think, help with clients to kind of understand, you know, why this would not be fun for the animal or why it's not okay. Uh, if you go in the shop on drsophiayin.com and you scroll to the bottom, you can still get these as a free download. You can also buy these. Okay, this one is dog park etiquette. This is a really good one for, whoopsie. Reducing reactive play, and this is like a mirror. Okay, reactive play in dogs. So what this handout is showing is uh, you wouldn't want kids to uh, run up, you know, having like a child rushing up onto another child on the playground, and that's what that little cartoon picture shows. 
like a young child and two big children running up like bulldozing them over which is just like at say the dog park we have big dogs rushing up on a little dog well this also could say home dog etiquette you know home play etiquette or backyard play etiquette it's all the same thing the rushing up on each other is that you know body slamming roughhousing play that to the one getting slammed on can be very threatening and so then this picture shows the right thing to do let's get a ball and toss it for each individual dog um you know allowing dogs to steal toys from each other is on here uh you know, having, you know, other children playing too roughly. So anyway, this is like that analogy poster. And there's a number like this on Dr. Yen's site. This one is also showing, this one in general saying how children should not um, interact with dogs. There's another one that also shows the same kind of comparison. You like hugging a dog. is like somebody coming up to your child and suddenly just hugging them or pinching their cheek. You know, the child doesn't like the cheek pinch. That's why the dog doesn't like to be hugged. So these are some resources you can download from other websites to, you know, have and to hand out to people, to send them in an email for veterinary clinics and shelters to have readily that you can mail to people, you can email to people, you could literally hand that to them. And I think this is a, a way that we can, in a very, um, like kind of easy and gentle way, break through some of these beliefs, you know, that people have about the rough and rowdy play or early aggression that humans, the owners are normal, seeing as normal, seeing as acceptable, to, and to help them see that, oh, I guess it really isn't, and I need to have also work on changing these lower levels of aggression. Um, thank you very much. I have a couple announcements to make. So uh, Sunday, April 23rd, I will be uh, having my, hosting my uh, canine and feline aggressive and anxious, uh, low stress veterinary care workshop. So this is gonna be live streamed. It's live the whole day. It will have PowerPoint presentation and myself handling, you know, on live webcam. And I do it through a meeting type um, setup rather than a true webinar setup because I want that chat box and the ability for people to, you know, unmute themselves or even if they want to get a webcam themselves to share and be very interactive. I did this in June, it was really successful and very interactive. Um, and, you know, uh, so it's seven hours race approved. There are discounts for those of you who are Fear Free certified and Low Stress Handling certified. It is also CCPDT approved and IAABC approved for continuing education. Okay, so that's August 23rd. Go to my website, drsallyjfoot.com. Go to the shop. You might have to go down a few of my listings, but it'll be there and I'll put the link to it again up on Facebook. Um, I am also having some other client level webinars. Um, you know, I just did one recently on separation and anxiety, and I'm gonna have another client webinar uh, August 27th on how canine housemate aggression. So those are available at my shop, on my website. Um, again, thank you for attending. Uh, I look forward to any kind of comments, you know, your emails. Uh, share this content around and uh, have a great day.